All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Amy Weichardt. I'm the director at the library. We're really excited to welcome a wonderful group of writers here who are all contributors to the Breaking Bread anthology. Um, we're also excited to have Lynn Bolger here to moderate the conversation. So we'll have readings from each of the writers and then a Q and A and conversation. Um, so I'm going to uh, quickly introduce Lynn. Um, oh, and also just so you know, the, this talk is being recorded. So we have some people on Zoom as well. So you can always view the recording later. Um, so Lynn Bolger is the executive director of the Authors Guild Foundation. Uh, previously, she was the director of advancement for the College of the Atlantic for over 13 years. Uh, she lives in Blue Hill, Maine. And we're really excited to have her here tonight. Thank you, Lynn. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you. Um, thanks, Amy. And um, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having us here at this beautiful library in this beautiful room. And for the Northeast Harbor Library that brings excellent programming all year long to us. I'm delighted to be here with you all and with these powerhouse women writers, one of whom I've known for 40 years, one I've known for 20, and one whom I have been here to meet tonight. So um, Kim Ridley, Roxana Robinson, and Annalise Jakin. Jik you got it? <laughs> Jakimides. Jakimides. Um, we'll read together from the book Breaking Bread, Essays from New England on Food, Hunger, and Family. And for those who don't know the backstory of this book, it's really fascinating. So Deborah Joy Corey um, is a writer who lives in Maine, and she was researching food hunger in the state. And um, she expected to find it in all of the places that we here at Northeast Harbor expect to find food insecurity in Maine, Washington County villages, maybe the Arusta County. But what she did not expect to find was food insecurity in her picture perfect town of Cascine, Maine. Um, she started digging into this issue and um, talk to local community leaders and church leaders and uh, school principals. And what she found was while there are food pantries and um, other sort of safety nets for food insecure people, what they lacked most of all was um, access to fresh produce and vegetables and healthy um, alternatives to Kraft macaroni and cheese. And um, so unlike many of us, she did something about it. She, she went to the, uh, her local church in Castine and asked them, could I start a garden here? And which she did. And then she started roping in um, local farmers to give their excess and, um, uh, you know, not perfectly cosmetic um, tomatoes, et cetera, to the, to, to her efforts. She got local people who have gardens to, um, start giving to the name of the not-for-profit is Blue Angel. And she was so fabulously successful. Her youngest gardener is Fiona. No, she's seven years old and her name is Fiona. Um, Deb wrote, the often used phrase, food insecure, seems to soften the crisis of hunger I have witnessed. Ravenous, starving, I could eat a horse and chase the rider. These are things I say at the first twinge of hunger. I never say I feel a little food insecure. The low impact of this language is dangerous. It provides comfort to the wrong people allowing the fortunate to maintain an illusion that hunger in our community is a mere inconvenience instead of the immediate crisis it is. So she um, started Blue Angel and conceived of this book, Breaking Bread, not as a way to help fund sustainably her efforts, 
But actually, what she found was that many of the recipients of her services didn't have happy food memories. And so she turned to a few dozen of her close friends, main writers and other writers. I mean, the, the book is an anthology of some of the best writers in America today. Um, and shared, had them share these memories. And it is a beautiful, moving collection that illustrates the intimate moments that surround the preparation of food and sharing it with the people we love. The work of it, the smell of it, the touch of it, the taste of it, and how these moments of breaking bread are some of the most cherished memories we have seared into our earliest memories of childhood. And Kim Ridley will be our first reader tonight. You'll see what I mean when she reads her essay, A Mess of Peas. Kim is a science writer, essayist, contributing editor to Downey's Magazine, and the author of nonfiction books for children, including The Secret Pool. Her new book for adults is Wild Design, Nature's Architects. She lives in Brooklyn, Maine. Kim, we are so happy to have you here. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. By the way, Lynn and I have known each other for 40 years. Uh, what a privilege and a gift and a joy your friendship is. Thank you. And thank you, Amy, for having us and gathering us all together. This is an essay about my father. I grew up in Southern Maine, uh, 10th generation in York County. Um, and there are parts of this that I'm going to be reading in my father's voice. He had a wonderful Maine accent. So oh, you'll be hearing him. <laughs> A mess of peas. In a photo that I took of him more than 30 years ago, my father watches over me from his pea patch. The peas are blooming and he is in his prime, burly in a navy blue baseball cap, green polo shirt and jeans, his arms as brown as the ground he works. His expression is serious, unusual for a cheerful man who loved to joke around and sing Willie Nelson tunes. A man whose standard response to, how are you, Russ, was, if I was any better, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> this was especially true when he had his hands in the dirt, as he did every spring and summer afternoon after filling potholes and digging ditches all day for the Maine State Highway Department. Peas were the first seeds he planted after the interminable winter. If you want peas on the 4th of July, Plant them on Patriot's Day in April, he always said, when the maples bloom and the first wood thrushes return to Southern Maine. I don't remember the first time I helped my father plant peas, but I was surely young, maybe six or seven. Following along behind him, I mimicked his gestures, strewing wrinkled pellets into shallow furrows, then gently tamping soil over them with my small bare hands, my fingers stinging with cold. I never grew into the passionate gardener my father was, but something else took root. After the peas bloomed in June, we kept a close watch on the pods. One day they were flat, the next swelling with tiny peas, which could get away from you fast and grow big and mealy, the sugars turning to starch. We picked the first peas when the pods yielded to a gentle squeeze and the peas inside were the size of a baby's first teeth. This we did with two hands, one to hold the vine, the other to gently pluck the pods. That's a nice mess of peas, my father would say after we filled a basket. Preparing peas became a ritual. We fetched a pot and sat at the round oak table on the screened porch where my father showed me the secret to shelling them. Gently press the curved end of the pod with your thumb until it pops open. Turn the pod with the pointed end facing down and run your thumb along the inside so the peas clink into the pot. There was no rushingness, yet with time my fingers grew nimble and efficient. The knowledge embedded itself in my hands. After we filled the pot with green pearls, we covered them with water, boiled them for one minute, then drained and served them in a white china bowl with at least two tablespoons of butter and a sprinkling of salt and pepper. 
Our family feasted on steaming bowls of peas, that first mouthful. Here was something that couldn't be bought, something worth the wait, tiny tender orbs of green sweetness, the essence of early summer. We gorged on peas from my father's garden night after night until we'd had our fill. It was an unspoken rule that freezing peas was a crime and canning them a sacrilege. It was understood that peas from the garden were only to be eaten fresh. My father always grew more than we could eat, so he shared them, delivering messes of fresh peas to family and friends. This was the way he grew up, on a subsistence farm in Springvale, a mile down the road from the little cave where he and my mother raised my brother and me. We often walked to my dad's old home on summer evenings and I pestered him for stories. I loved asking him for tiny details, like what his family had for supper in winter. He told me most of it was from the root cellar and all of it cooked by my grandmother on the kitchen wood stove. Red flannel hash, biscuits with salt pork gravy, apple crisp or cake for afters. Wasn't it hard to live like that? I asked my father one evening. I told him I couldn't imagine growing and preserving most of my own food, cutting firewood by hand and living without electricity and running water. Well, we didn't get one one day, we did the next, he said laughing. We never hurried, he paused, and we always had time. In all of his nearly 85 years, I never recall seeing my father hurry. The photo of my father in his pea patch sits on my desk in a silver frame. I study his serious expression and wonder what he was thinking that day. As much as I loved him and his stories, he was also a mystery to me, as we humans are to one another, even among beloveds. For years, I was embarrassed when my city friends asked what my father did for a living. I couldn't understand how he could be content with so little and live nearly all of his life on one small patch of ground in Maine. I have always wanted more of everything, and I'm always in a hurry. This will be my 10th year without my father. I'm a haphazard gardener, but my husband Tom and I always plant peas on Patriot's Day in our own garden in Brooklyn, nearly four hours north from my childhood home. On a cool evening in early July, we gather the fragile harvest, filling a basket with perfect pods. We sit on the deck together and shell peas. A hermit thrush sings and the late afternoon sun flashes through the spruce woods. We talk about my father, how much we loved him. After preparing the peas, I pour them into two blue bowls. We eat them slowly. The buttery sweetness bursts in my mouth. I close my eyes. I have time. Next, we have Roxana Robinson, the author of 10 books six novels, three collections of short stories, and the seminal biography of Georgia O'Keeffe. Her fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Harper's, Best American Short Stories, Tin House, and many other places. Her work has been widely anthologized and broadcast on NPR. She is the past president of the Authors Guild and serves on the board as well as on the board of the Authors Guild Foundation. Roxana, come tell us about Kentucky Bread. <laughs> thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Tana, for the wonderful speech. Um, and thank you to the library for this event. Um, it makes me very happy to, to be reading here. So this is called Kentucky Bread. <clears throat> Pine Mountain is in the southeastern corner of Kentucky. It's a steep, densely forested region, remote and beautiful. Early settlers there led hard scrabble lives, clearing wooded slopes, plowing sloping hillsides, building cabins up in the hollows. The land, land was slant and challenging. It resisted farming, but it was generous in other ways lush with plant life, vivid with animals, lavish with views. 
The isolated life of the mountaineers meant a paucity of education and schools were few and far between. The children who lived back in the hollers were a long way from any classroom and many of them never reached one at all. Troubled by this, in 1913, a farmer named William Creech founded a school. He was a large hearted man and he had a vision. I have heart and craving that our people may grow better, he wrote. I have deeded my land to the Pine Mountain Settlement School, hoping it may make bright and intelligent people after I'm dead and gone. Creech donated several hundred acres to the school, rich green bottomland at the foot of Pine Mountain, down in the narrow valley where Isaac's Run meets Shell Run to form Greasy Creek. Pine Mountain was a boarding school. It taught academic subjects, but Creech wanted to preserve the regional crafts and culture. So the girls learned baking, quilting, and weaving, as well as Shakespeare, and the boys farming, carving, and woodworking. The students worked at the school farm, which produced all their food. It had a dairy herd, chickens and pigs, oxen and mules. The early settlers had come from England and Scotland and their traditions, the old songs, the ballads and dances and festivals were honored. May Day was a great celebration in that green bottom land along the winding creek. Pine Mountain was where I was born, though it's not where my family was from. My father was from New York. He went to boarding school in New England and then on to Harvard where he trained to be a lawyer like his father. My mother grew up in Philadelphia, outside Philadelphia, where her father, too, was a lawyer. She went to a private school and then to Vassar. When my parents married in 1935, they moved to an apartment in Murray Hill. It seemed like the start of a conventional, decorous, and affluent life, but things took a sharp left turn. My father didn't find satisfaction in the practice of corporate law, much to his father's disappointment. My father felt stifled by an absence of ideals and altruism. A bit like William Creech, my father had a heart and craving to help people. So he changed everything. He left the law for education. He left the Episcopalian church for the Society of Friends. He left New York City for the hinterlands. Who's to say what drives the shifts and turns of a family's narrative? As I look back, my family's history is so familiar to me that these moves seem inevitable, entirely predictable. Of course, my father left the law. It's so obvious now he wouldn't have been happy there. Of course, we all went to Pine Mountain, which is so central to our history. Of course, we left Kentucky later and moved finally to Pennsylvania, where the, my parents spent the rest of their lives and where I grew up. How else could it have been? At the time, though, it must have been a tremendous adventure for my parents. Exciting, but perilous. There was no turning back as they walked forward into the rest of their lives, which still lay hidden before them. My mother embraced the venture. She shared my father's ideals, and she left the Presbyterian Church to become a Quaker. She left her friends, her family, and the life she'd known, moving to a remote community a remote mountain community. This was during World War II when transportation was difficult and communication limited. Our family lived in a log cabin with a sleeping law for the children reached by a ladder. The only traffic on the dirt roads was from carts and sledges pulled by mules and oxen. In some ways, the life was primitive, but Pine Mountain offered one great luxury, three hot meals a day. Everyone at the school ate in the communal dining room at Big Law, so my mother did not have to cook, which was a good thing since she had never learned how. <laughs> my mother's family lived in a pleasant house on the main line outside Philadelphia. They had a cook and a maid. On Sunday evenings, when the cook was off, my grandmother would say brightly to her children, now dears, we're having some, a special treat for supper tonight. Graham crackers and milk. <laughs> this happened every week. In my own family, in our family, when I was growing up, whenever, whenever my mother's invention or larder was empty, we had the same meal, which I loved. 
Every family has its own culinary traditions, its own peculiar idiosyncratic attitudes towards food. Every family thinks its own attitudes are the norm. It's not until you're older that you realize that everyone doesn't eat the way you do. My grandparents were married in 1899. I still have my grandmother's recipe box with her collection, which was started before they married and continued for decades. It's full of carefully handwritten entries like Mrs. Louis Searle's orange cake. These are replete with detailed instructions about stirring and baking. <clears throat> but I don't think my grandmother actually made the dishes. I think she and her friends traded recipes and then gave them to their cooks. I think they were proud and proprietary about what came from their kitchens, but didn't produce them it themselves. This cul culinary deficiency is not limited to my own family. It seems to be tribal. We wasps are not famous for our cuisine, but we've always eaten. We've made meals for centuries. It's just that our food seems to be a bit dull, a bit limited, though it's healthy and nourishing. Our meals are more like obligation than celebration. But since everything comes from somewhere, where does this cuisine come from and where do we get our feelings about food? Several years ago, I went to Scandinavia for the first time and I was amazed by how familiar it seemed. The whole region produced a deep cultural res resonance. For a wasp from the Northeast, it seemed like an or summer community, the one on which all others are modeled. The shingle style architecture, mountains, the rocky shorelines, the beautiful but challenging terrain, everyone dying to get out on the water, yellow rain slickers, a cold, uncertain climate, a bleak religion, deep personal reserve, an unflinching dedication to principle, inclination towards austerity, sternness and implacable judgment. I had arrived at my mythic ancestral homeland. <laughs> Though no one in my family is from Scandinavia, and my ancestors are mostly from England, Scotland, and Ireland. But the tribal affinity was reinforced when I read Independent People by the Icelandic author Haldor Laxness, who won the Nobel Prize in 1955. His characters were so eerie, eerily familiar to me, I thought we'd been separated at birth. And in a way we had, the Vikings had a profound effect on the British Isles, raiding and settling them for several hundred years before the Norsemen, the Normans who were actually Norsemen arrived in 1066. It was the Vikings who predominated culturally and genetically. Wasps are said to have originated in the British Isles but really we go straight back to Scandinavia reserve, austerity, asceticism, and a certain Northern tendency towards pessimism. <laughs> For a New Englander with a long Puritan tradition, all this was very familiar to me. <laughs> Physically too, we seemed related, the long bones, the fair skin, the blue eyes, and linguistically, there were a surprising number of shared words, broad for bread, bakery for bakery, the relationship to food seemed familiar as well. A certain Spartan self-denial, something very practical under the circumstances. The Scandinavian growing season is short, the climate is hard, and the terrain is difficult. Nature is not reliably bountiful, and meals reflect this. A slice of good brown bread, a chunk of hard cheese, a few berries, and a swig of cold water might easily be lunch. I've Forgive me if I'm offending any Scandinavians. You probably have a much better culinary um, culture than I am aware of, but this is what I thought. This was an attitude I knew very well. In our family, meals were never the gorgeous celebrations that seemed to occur daily in a Mediterranean household. For us, eating was always marginal, an afterthought. Oh, right, lunch. Bread and cheese and a swig of water were perfectly acceptable. We'd have been thrilled by berries. My mother did not enjoy cooking and had no hired help at all. There were five children and meals were haphazard, scrambled together at the last minute. It was always an agreeable su surprise to discover that food had been somehow found. Oh, dinner, right, or not, we didn't actually much care. If you asked my father at night what he'd had for lunch, he wouldn't be able to remember if he'd had lunch. This attitude had been passed down in my DNA. 
When I'm alone, I often forget to eat. And when I'm working, I have the same lunch every day for months. It's minimalist in the extreme. Two slices of good bread with good cheese and good butter. Right back to Scandinavia. Our family voyage ended in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. There my father became the head of a friend's school and there he lived for the rest of his life. We moved on, but we kept Pine Mountain with us and our stay there is at the heart of our family history. Pine Mountain was our family's great adventure. It was where we lived for a time at a vital confluence of ideals and hardship, education and tradition. It was a foray into a splendid, challenging landscape that we've never forgotten. These braided memories twine through our shared consciousness. The life there, the wild countryside, the mountain people, the ballads and the country dances is still part of us. It's in all our stories. It's where my older brother learned to love the woods. It's where my older sister learned to quilt. It's where my second brother was chased by a pig. It, and it's where I was born, delivered by Dr. Elizabeth in the two Rome school infirmary. It's where we learned the songs that we still sing whenever we're together. Sourwood Mountain, Lord Lovell, Barbary Allen. They remind us of the, that beautiful green valley along the winding creek. And it's where my mother learned to bake bread. My mother's recipe for whole wheat bread is from Pine Mountain. I don't know who taught it to her, but the mountain settlers of Kentucky were originally from Scotland and England as ours were. 400 years ago, our ancestors were all in the British Isles. And 400 years before that, they were all in Denmark getting ready for a savage raid on the Scottish coast. Our history and the lineage of this bread goes back a long way. I think of this Kentucky bread as a part of my culinary heritage, even if it doesn't come from my grandmother. My mother gave it to me and I've given it to my daughter. My mother wrote the recipe down by hand and she baked it herself. She cherished this recipe and so do I, and so does my daughter. How else, how else is a family recipe defined? I've baked this bread for years. It's the best and simplest recipe I know. Oddly, this bread doesn't much like being baked in a city and I could never make it happy in New York. But in, the country, in, but in country kitchens, the recipe has never disappointed me, though many times I've disappointed it. I've set the bread to rise and forgotten it and left it in the oven. I've run out of time and cut the rising short. I've forgotten the salt. I've run out of wheat flour or white flour. I've used the wrong proportions. But Kentucky bread is always forgiving which is just what you'd hope for from your family. It's very happy being baked in Maine, where for 30 years I spent my summers and for 20 years part of my winters. The loaves come out firm and solid, brown and crusty outside, nicely hollow within when you knock on them and smelling like heaven. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I love that. So beautiful. Um, Annalise Jakimides is a writer and mixed media artist who grew up in Boston and raised a family in Mount Chase, Maine, growing almost all of her own family's food and pumping water by hand. She now lives in an old high school in Bangor and writes in a closet. In addition to working with inner city environmental justice organizations and international art groups, she co-founded the Belfast Poetry Festival and has created and implemented arts and humanities programs in rural schools, libraries, and prisons. Her poetry and prose have been published in many journals, anthologies, and magazines, and broadcast on Maine Public and NPR. Annalise will read, I tell Henry the plate is red. Thank you. Um, I just want to start by saying how honored I am to be here with Kim and Roxana and Lynn and all of you. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous book. 
I can't begin to tell you if you haven't read it. Um, the dynamics, the breadth, the depth of these essays. So when I got a hold of this book before it even was published, it was one of those free pub things that came to the local bookstore. And I went down to Gibran in downtown Bangor. And I said, Gibran, I have to read it. And I read the thing cover to cover. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> whether I'm the only person who's actually done that, but I read it cover to cover. And it's just absolutely moving because every one of us sitting here, here, there, we all, what joins us is food. We all have food in common. It may not be the same food, but we all have food memories. So I'm just delighted to have been asked to read today. Now, this is not the story that I could have lived, which was your dad's story. I just wanted to say that, that dad's story. So when you sit down to write any one of these essays, I'm sure this is true for everybody. You really don't know what's going to rise up and what's going to be the story that you ultimately end up writing. I tell Henry the plate is red. Although Henry and I have been eating together for years, Brazilian and French, Cuban, Filipino, Turkish, and the 24 hour mashed potato diner near his place in Brooklyn that stays open every holiday, he's never eaten in the place where I live until now. He's never even visited. Henry is my love, my late in life love the impossible love who crossed my path about 12 years ago after my 27 year marriage was over and the three children were grown and gone, one really gone like my love would be. We met when he was performing in Orono, Charlie Musselwhite, Deborah Coleman, Corey Harris and Henry Butler, no food involved. When I pick him up at the airport, he's surprised that almost everyone knows me. I remind him that this is a small place I could walk to the airport or the bus station. Bus is how I usually travel when I go to visit him, take the Concord to the Greyhound, then to Port Authority, where I catch the Metro, three changes, many stops, a stroll down the street, past Colados, the family owned Dominican fast food place with community tables that we love. The L rattles overhead, flecking daylight through the grime crusted rails. Finally, key in the door, of course, getting a key to Henry's didn't happen immediately. It might have, it could have, if I realized that all I had to do was give him the key to my world, no strings attached, meaning you're always welcome. You will never find me being anyone but me, the me that you know and trust. When we enter my building, he immediately perceives that I live in an old high school, the broad high ceiling hallway and the faint must of old wood and plaster make it clear. Sun glitters through my 20 foot tall living room window, revealing the patinaed copper dome of the library next door. With the bowl of sky over the dome, it looks as if I could be living in a European city, maybe Portuguese or French, instead of Bangor. Although Henry's performed in those countries, it's not the look of my place that matters to him. He has never seen any of it, although I often forget that he cannot see. All right, let me get this out of the way. I know it will linger if I don't. Infant glaucoma, untreated, so shortly after birth, totally blind, no life, eyeballs removed. He can identify everything by scent and taste, texture and sound. For days, I have been making lists. Peppermint leaves, long-grained organic brown rice, unripe bananas, Granny Smith apples, bulbs and bulbs of garlic, scallops from McLaughlin seafood down the road. And planning meals. Cabbage salad, purple and green with wine-soaked raisins, toasted sunflower seeds, diced apples, onions. Nut loaf, cooked rice, cottage cheese, walnuts and cashews ground in the old hand grinder. Tofu pie, chunked with carrots and eggplant, nutritional yeast and tamari, ginger, mom's pie crust, still unmastered but acceptable. <laughs> All with bread, not mine, I no longer bake. I've stocked the refrigerator as much as I can. Usually the interior is cavernous with open spaces and an easy view to every corner. Now it's so full, I hold a map in my head of where and behind what. I know that these are the only days I will have to feed him. I will chop and season and cook in the tiny galley kitchen. I haven't fed anybody three meals a day for five days straight since I moved to this apartment almost 20 years ago. I'm not saying have to, like it's an obligation, a weight as in, oh damn, I gotta feed this man every day shit. 
No, yeah. it is literally all I will have. This one time in which to cook for and serve him. I can't say how I am so convinced, so sure that this will be it, that he'll never be in my apartment again. Perhaps it's because it's taken him all these years to free enough days to come to a small town with no music, even if his love lives there. Perhaps it's the rumble of rapidly expanding cancer cells I can hear and he can't. A few years ago, we met three other couples at Chez Josephine on West 42nd for dinner. I was the only sighted person at the table and read the entire menu aloud and loudly in the crowded restaurant. I am convinced food has a language, is a language, beyond its spoken tongues of escargot a la bourguignon and pisciladera. It comes out in your choices, your offerings and awarenesses, reactions. You don't get to know someone because of what they tell you about themselves. That's a facade or a shroud, a strange covering, the surface. I am New England, not fancy. He is Southern New Orleans. Henry and I were born days apart, worlds apart, foods apart. I went to public school. He went to boarding school for the blind. Neither of us cooked at home. While Henry was playing the piano in St. Petersburg and Paris, developing his palate, I was back to the lander learning how to boil water on an old King Kenyo wood cook stove in Mount Chase, Maine, population 146, in the shadow of Mount Katahdin. Dirt road, no electricity, a red Deming hand pump. Growing up in Boston, I had no interest in knowing where food came from or how to prepare it. When I married and moved north, I never envisioned that we would grow or gather almost everything we ate, including borage and pigweed, wild mint, dandelion root, and thistle. Nikki Giovanni says that you take what you have and make what you can. It's how I learned to cook, to write, to make art. No instructions except to not waste what you know, what you feel, what you have. I learned I could always make something from nothing. Henry is checking out the old crock on the kitchen counter filled with my cooking utensils. He runs his palm along the hand carved donut stick. I no longer have a need for, but still love the shape, the smooth maple. He fingers the old wooden spoon with the singed bowl. I know he's building a story of what they are, where they have been before he asks or not. Sometimes looking is enough like today. For a moment, I wish he could have experienced me up north in the old kitchen big enough to hold both this living room and the galley space. The room was southern light and a table made from an old bowling lane with plenty of room to measure, roll, chop, and mix. Food from the land, immediacy, freshness, and music flooding from speakers mounted in the high corners of the barn beam ceiling. Luciano Pavarotti said, one of the very nicest things about life is the way we must regularly stock whatever it is we are doing and devote our attention to eating. Still, I often skip eating, waiting for hunger itself to drive me to food, often just food at hand. Today, I'm neither hungry nor casually at handing. I'm purposeful and happy to be feeding someone I love, this particular someone I love. Breakfast already in motion, I pre-chop extra onions and green peppers to go with my cheese soup later. I say my, because nothing I make ever turns out the same. Another go at it and I'll have a new version. <laughs> Henry is waking hungry these days here with me, unusual for him. He sits at the early morning table in a soft ocean of thin light leaking through the east window. I only have east windows, morning windows, windows that are today channeling a fierce winter wind. I watch his face, his whole face, glasses off and his straight back. He was shocked one night at Dizzy's when I told him how a certain pianist was almost lying on the keys when he performed. He always thought everyone played sitting straight up as he did. I can see him easily through the rectangular opening over the sink between the kitchen and the living room. For the first time, I wonder why we don't call them cooking rooms like living and dining rooms. I realize my chairs are not quite enough for his large ass and deep chest capable of rolling out thunderous notes, a moving baritone. I've cooked eggs, large and fat yellow scrambled. I've never mastered over easy or sunny side up a perfect omelet. 
He uses Louisiana hot sauce. For me, it's that wicked hot Deer Camp 12 gauge ginger made in Waterville. You can cook, he says. <laughs> There's almost an exclamation point at the end. He looks right at me. His smile opens the world. We have eaten. I've made breakfast and lunch and dinner, washed all the dishes. He's listening now to Taishan Sori. It's like dessert to me, the sound of Sori swirling in the room, licking into his ears and mine. Sometimes he doesn't like to listen to music, but I'm hell bent on playing some while he's here, on his knowing that I have a deep and diverse sound bank in my head, my heart. I don't know how to talk music any more than I know how to talk food. I can only show you, and that requires you to be in my world, even just this once. So I can show you, Henry, my love, how I set the table, cloth napkins, some from my mother, almost 30 years gone, the square plates with the tilted edges, food safe in the middle, I tell you, they are red. How I scrub the carrots and the apples, vinegaring them just as you do. How my landscape is shaped, the long community tables at Bagel Central around the corner, like a Colados in the tiny halal place on your street, the people, the conversations, the love. How the earth shifts, tectonic plates adjusting to apples and sauce, coriander and cheese, tofu, peppermint, and potatoes from the fields up north, food made by my hand, placed on your plate at the little square table, our faces inches apart, feeding each other in unimaginable ways, sustenance and salvation over and over again in this cluster of days in the February before you leave. I'm going to switch the microphone. Yeah. We're going to do Q and A now, and um, because uh, Amy, could you explain about the owl? Yeah. So this is a microphone for the people on Zoom, so that they can. So when we do the Q and A, and I hope you have questions, but uh, we'll start if anybody raises her hand or his hand. Um, and you're doing the Zoom now too. Yeah. Yeah. And if I stand here, do you have to Yeah. I can hide behind this. Perfect. Um, uh, my question uh, to each of you, and I'll, I'll start right as we started um, in our reading, is if you did not write this story about food in your memory, what story would you have written? I'm sure there were a number of attempts or ideas, and I'd like to hear the rejects, please. <laughs> the rejects. <laughs> oh, that's funny. About food in particular? Yeah, that you were. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I actually went pretty straight for this. Um, straight for the piece. Straight for the piece, to be really honest. Um, but the other story that I thought about um, is on my mother's side, uh, French Canadian food waste. Um, but uh, the, I just, the P and I, uh, the P's were just right, right front center for me. Yeah. And, and Roxanna, <laughs> this is so awkward to be standing here. I think I'm going to uh, I'm going to, King, I'm going to bring your chair and I'm going to sit with you um, But Roxanna, you who don't think about food, did you have another? Idea? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, as you hear, food is not central in my in my our, my family culture, nor is it something that I think about a lot. I think if I had not written about the bread, I would have written about a food related object, which is the little man, the bride and groom that sit on top of the wedding cake, and that we still have this object in um, a canister, a tin canister in the house that my husband and I are living in now, which my grandparents built. 
And it's the bride and groom that stood on a wedding cake of my grandparents mm -hmm. in 1899 and my parents. And I was asked to paint the faces, which of course they come off because it's made of sugar, um, for my oh. sister's wedding. So this tiny, fragile, sugar <laughs> pair of um, bride and grooms is there and each face is daubed with my 12-year-old attempts at watercolor. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect little eye, big mouth, no, that's not what happens. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a sugar object, it's a food object. It's just not <laughs> edible. But that would have been um, the story of that sort of generational transition and the way objects, the, the way they create kind of a presence in your family life. I do have to say that when I picked up the book um, and I saw Roxana's name on the thing, I'm like, how could Roxana be writing a book? We were we were talking about uh, last year's Champlain Institute. Now it's called the Summer Institute at CUA, and she's like, who wants to who wants to talk about who? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> and at least did you have something else that you were toying with? Well, you... I don't know whether it was really toying with. Although I do want to, I do want to follow up a little bit when you were talking about who the Roxanne and how it's not your thing. There are a lot of things, a lot of essays in this book that really are about people who really didn't have a good relationship with food. But you still write about food, even if it's not if it's not your thing, because none of us would be here if we weren't eating something. <laughs> okay, so th there's there's part of that which I I found fascinating. Um, I think I pretty much went right to this, although I certainly thought of other things. Here's mm, I've said this before, and I think Kim heard me say this. I pretty much work when a first line comes to me, and it feels like the first line. Um, I feel like I've gotten on the train and the train is taking off and I don't know what the destination is because I forgot to look at the sign <laughs> but I'm going, you know? So that's generally how I operate. But there were two other things that could have, once I started to really think about it, that could have um, maybe made good essays about food. Um, one is uh, getting married. Okay, back in the city, in my mother's backyard, a little postage stamp sized yard in Dorchester. Okay, and because we were of a back to the land mentality, even though we hadn't gone yet, um, we sent out all these invitations to people with no RSVP. Okay, and 500 people showed up in my mother's backyard. Okay, so the food element around that might have made an interesting essay, you know, for, for that kind of thing. And also, I don't often think of myself in this way, and I don't say this often, but we're an immigrant family, okay? I'm, I'm the first generation born in this country, the first to go to college. And, and so you've got all that immigrant food situation that is part of your, your, your growing up, um, even when you're, you know, well, you have got that thing too. We all have it, but it's just it, it, all of that kind of stuff. You're just never, you know, you're never sure how how those things will all blend together. So, yeah. Um, if you have questions, please. Yes, please. Uh, who or what influenced you in your earlier beginnings on this literary journey of yours? Um, I was really influenced by John Updike. I would read his stories in the New Yorker and just think this is this is a possibility of using language in such a rich and elegant and eloquent way and and delivering people's feelings to the world in a way that I found exquisite and compelling. And so there are lots of reasons where that he's fallen out of favor, but he was a great, great writer, particularly about family. And really, he taught me to write. 
Uh, I was depending upon where, where to start. I was thinking, you know, growing up in Maine, of course, I loved Phoebe White and Rich would read Charlotte's Web over and over and cry. But my parents had to take it away from me and hide it. Um, but I was just, I was captivated. My parents brought me to the library every week. I was an avid reader. Um, but as an adult, um, Annie Gillard, children at Tinker Creek. Um, and nobody, I had never been exposed to that in school. Nobody told me about it. I found it at the library and was just riveted. Um, you can one can write about the world this way and bring in all of these other strands of philosophy and the cosmos. And um, and then I just, that was a fun really wanted to inspire. Um, I, you're talking about being a child it reminds me of this. Um, my parents really weren't readers. My mother was a, a, a smoking Newport cigarette at the kitchen table, drinking coffee, reading romances. I mean, that was, the, that was the, the biggest reading that there really was going on. But I do remember saving all the money that I got um, when I was growing up for two years to buy the illustrated book of children's literature. Okay, and I held up every dime, every quarter, every dollar I got at my birthday, I held on to until I could afford to buy that book at Denison's in downtown Boston. I can remember so clearly this, this, this store. Um, and so, so obviously lots of writers influenced me, but if I really had to answer that question, I would say it was Doug Fletcher, the editor at the Holton Pioneer Times when I lived on that dirt road who gave me a shot, okay? Because I, I never thought I, I could write. I mean, I, I love to read. I mean, so it was all reading, you know, um, all of you, <laughs> you know? Um, but he, he just, I mean, that's, that's what small communities can do. You know, they can provide that. So I decided I wanted to write a little bit about my life. I didn't know how to do that. And I called it the literary weather, a little pretentious, but I, I didn't know what else to you know, say. So I went to Doug, which was 40 miles from where I lived um, at, the, at the newspaper. And I, I had a 300 page little thing, a 300 word little thing that was about the weather, but from a liter what, little, the literary standpoint. And he gave me a shot and I cut my teeth on those. I mean, we, you know, I did them twice a month and I just cut my teeth on them. So I think that, you know, giving people a shot at things, so many of us have so many stories to tell us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to, I have no stake in this book whatsoever. I bought this book with anticipation of coming to the reading. And it is the most charming book. And I don't know who the editor is, but where did you find all this talent? There is so much writing down in Maine. And I don't think you said this, Lindsay, but like the proceeds from this book go to the hunger project. Mm -hmm. And you know, the writing is just staggering. And the editing was brilliant. But after Roxanne was beautifully written piece. There's a very short piece, but I think this is one of the longer ones. There's an ode to the PB and J. There's a sort of pacing to the editing of it. And it is the most wonderful thing to read at night. I mean, I read two or three of them at night. I, I, I haven't been in all the way through because I've saved them. Mm -hmm. And I see that there's a sacrifice for sale out there. I just can't have to read it. Um, more highly. So I want to thank you for calling our attention to this. That's just a little plug from somebody who has no say in it, but the sheer enjoyment of good writing. I, well, that is a great question. Do you all have personal connections to Debra, or who reached out to you to say, would you do something for this anthology? Uh, I got a, an email from another from Lee Smith, who is in this book, oh, yeah. who's a friend of mine, yeah. and she's a friend of Deborah's. And Deborah got in touch with her and said, Who do you know? And Lee wrote to me and said, Would you do this? And I said, Of course, of course. Yeah. Um, so I think it's the network, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Lee isn't just me, right? Yeah. Deborah, you. Yeah. And I know Deborah a little bit because I think she basically put out an ATV. I think there are other writers that she sent out an email. Um, to a bunch of people who's interested, she's very right well. Oh, Lisa, thank you. For you, a slightly different, I think. There were th 
I think we're the last three on board. <laughs> there were three of us who, who, who got a, um, an email, all three of us together, that said, oh, I can't believe I didn't think of you. Okay, um, but you, I mean, it's understandable. I mean, I don't have a book. I mean, it's understandable why you wouldn't think of me, but I, 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 I can't believe I didn't think of you, um, but would you be interested? And we had, we had three weeks to write the essay. Wow. Okay, to make the deadline. We had three weeks. Um, and, and you don't know at that point whether you're gonna make the cut either, because just because you wrote the darn thing doesn't mean they're gonna want it. <laughs> it doesn't, it really doesn't. And particularly at that late, late uh, 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 deal. Um, but we're, 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 yeah, so, and, and I'm like you, I think it's just, if I weren't in it, I think it's just the most fabulous book. Yeah, I keep it on my bedside table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can too. yeah. I, I I I just want to read some of the names. Well, okay, so um, on the front, Jennifer Finney Boylan, just spoke at COA Smith, and Richard Ford, Gabby Gunst, Teresa Jalali, uh, Lily King, Jonathan Leatham, Susan Minot, yeah, uh, Roxanne Robinson, Richard Russo B. Smith, Boutron, and it goes on and on and on. And many of these people, of course, have. So some are connections to me, but many don't, and I think it is that network. But I do know Deborah was blown away by the generosity of so many writers who, you know, said, "Yes, I'll help you in this project that I've never heard of." And mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, you know, they're 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 three and six pages each. I hope you get a lot of writers, anyway. It's so so great. I also want to say that you know the uh, public publishers don't usually get accolades, but this publisher is Beacon Press out of Boston. Okay, and they were really on board with doing this project and proceeds going to Blue Angel and 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 really gave a backing to even coordinating some of those beginning readings and that kind of thing. So they were fabulous and, and it's a beautiful book. You know, they did they did a great job with it too. So other questions or comments or what's our timing? We have to do Oh, sorry. Yeah, I do have a watch on my side. Oh, right on. Right at time. Yep. Six thirty. Yeah. It's six thirty. Yep. Oh, would you like to? Do you have anything you would like to add, or would we like to go and, and sell, sell and sit and <laughs> make them? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.